on the phone, uh, Ian Milheiser. He is a senior constitutional policy analyst at the Center for American Progress Action Fund and the editor of Think Progress Justice. Welcome to the program, Ian. It's good to be here. Thanks so much, Sam. So, Ian, uh, tell us um, the McCutcheon v. FEC. This case did not get the attention it warrants, I believe, uh, largely in part because, of course, uh, our, uh, our country is being held hostage by uh, the Republican Party. But uh, that aside, who brought the case and why? Well, there, there are two plaintiffs in the case. And, of course, the most high-profile plaintiff is the Republican Party. The other one is a conservative businessman. And what's at stake here is potentially whether we can still have limits on campaign contributions in this country. We're seeing from this Supreme Court an effort to dismantle our anti-corruption law. The reason why we have campaign finance law is because the Supreme Court said in the 70s that preventing corruption, preventing someone from essentially buying favors from lawmakers is so important that we're going to allow um, caps on contributions, we're going to allow regulation of those contributions to prevent that sort of corruption from taking place. And in Citizens United, they said, no, that rule doesn't apply anymore for super PACs and these other outside groups. Now they're Now they look like they're prepared to say that contributions to parties, maybe even contributions to candidates. This anti-corruption rule may not apply anymore. And it's taking us another step down a path that ends in a world where billionaires can write million-dollar checks straight to candidates, and there's nothing we can do about it. Okay, so let's. So uh, basically, what we're seeing is a, is a uh, another uh, chip, uh, uh, another t- sort of chink taken out of Buckley v. Vallejo, which is that case that you uh, you mentioned in this in the '70s, that uh, That's right. that 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 sort of created. Our, our modern campaign finance framework. All right, so tell us what um, specifically is uh, at in question here. Um, there are, are limits on what an individual can give to a specific candidate, and there's limits on how many candidates e- an individual can give to. That, that's right. So... The way that the law works is that you could only give, I think it's $2,600 to an individual candidate. There's a certain amount you're allowed to give to various party organizations. And then there are big caps on the total amount of money that a very wealthy individual is allowed to give to all groups and all candidates. It's about $123,000. That's the most money that a single wealthy individual can spend on candidates and on party groups. And this, the particular issue in this lawsuit is they want to get rid of that $123,000 cap. So to be clear, the issue here is we are talking about people who have already given $123,000. And the question is, having already given that much money to try to put the people they want in office, whether the law is able to say, you know what, six figures is enough or whether that cap's going to be eliminated by the Supreme Court and put us in a world where, through very elaborate money laundering schemes, it'll be possible to funnel a whole lot of money potentially to elect just a single candidate. And I want to get to that, that aspect of it, the, the money laundering, in a moment. But So Buckley v. Vallejo, it sets the, uh, the aggregate at the time at $25,000. And then I guess in 2002... Uh, there, uh, via campaign reform, it was sort of, uh, I guess, uh, inflation adjusted or indexed to inflation. Mm-hmm. But why, why, why twenty five thousand? I mean, how was that figure determined? I, I mean, I don't know that there was a great deal of thought that went into figuring out the twenty six hundred per candidate figure. It used to be one thousand dollars. Um, and then when McCain-Feingold was enacted um, during the Bush administration, there was some reluctance, I think, from some people to sign on to it. And so doubling that, doubling that 1000 and making it 2000 was part of the bargain. It was, it was a sweetener that was open to, open to people who were reluctant to, to put limits on campaign finance, um, on campaign financing. 
and then they also indexed it to inflation. But I don't know if there was an exact calculation. I think the theory is that $2,600 is a lot of money, but it's not so much money that you're going to be able to buy favors with it. You know, right. If I'm a candidate and I need to raise – I need to raise $5 million for my race. If someone can write me a $2,600 check, I'm going to like them. They're not going to, it's not going to corrupt me. But if someone can write me a $5 million check, I'm going to do whatever that guy wants. Okay. And so um, you, you have these different types of aggregate limits in terms of what you can give to candidates. What, what, now, what is the value, for instance, you know, the, it seems that the, the argument here is, is, is two part. One is that, or, or I guess, uh, tell us what the argument for those who want to overturn this is. Obviously, it's that um, I'm inhibited. Uh, if I can only spend $123,000, I don't have the, the ability to, to freely express myself and my political views uh, because I may want to, uh, to give to um, uh, 100 candidates. But it seems that there, there were sort of two aspects to this. One is they want to be able to give to more candidates, but they also basically want to be able to give uh, a, a, an unlimited amount to uh, groups that then turn around and fund other candidates. And that's where the sort of the, <clears throat> the money laundering comes in. That's right. I mean, there's something very insidious going on here. So it goes back to the Citizens United case. That was the case that said that corporations can give as much money as they want to super PACs and other third-party organizations. The super PACs were actually created by a later decision. But, you know, this whole network of groups that aren't connected to a candidate, that aren't connected to a party, but that are funding sometimes spending hundreds of millions of dollars to elect people, those were created by Citizens United and some of the decisions that followed from Citizens United. And we should say what, that theoretically, at least, and we all know in practice this is, a, this is sort of a joke, but at least theoretically, those outside expenditure groups are not supposed to coordinate with the campaign so that they are, they may have aligned interest, but they're not so aligned that they're actually strategizing together. That's right. That's the theory, is right. that Carl Rove's group and David Koch's group and Sheldon Adelson's group don't actually talk to the candidates. And, you know, if you believe that, then I've got a bridge to sell you. But that's the theory. Um, so what Citizens United did, the core of Citizens United, is it said that it is not corrupting. If I write a million dollar check to a third party organization that's then going to take my million dollars and use it to elect some guy somehow like that guy's never going to find out that I wrote that check. So he doesn't know that he should be grateful to me and do favors to me. That was the theory behind Citizens United. I don't believe it. That's what the Supreme Court said. What the plaintiffs in this new case are saying in this McCutcheon case is they're saying, wait a second. If it's not corrupting to write a million-dollar check to a third-party group and then have that million-dollar check you know, be spent on that candidate, and that's not going to lead to him being corrupted, how is it corrupting if you just write that million-dollar check to a bunch of Republican Party organizations and then it somehow gets funneled through a money laundering scheme to the candidate? How is that somehow more corrupting than if you write it to a super PAC? And frankly, I think the plaintiffs are right on that point. You, you know, if you're giving a million dollars to elect someone, it doesn't matter what sort of legalistic scheme you use to do it. What matters is that guy's going to find out who wrote him that check, and they are going to know where to lay the wreath of gratefulness, as one of the lower court judges put it. And so the problem is, the Supreme Court created a nonsensical distinction in Citizens United, and they are now looking like they may rely on this completely ridiculous distinction in order to take away some more protections because, you know, they've suddenly figured out that this distinction doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, I mean, it was, I guess, uh, this is one thing that uh, people pointed out here, and um uh, and I, I think you wrote a piece about it. Scalia said at one point, and we should say that the the oral arguments took place, um, was it yesterday or no, two days ago, Wednesday, 
Uh, excuse me, Tuesday. It was it October 8th, I think it was. And yeah, I, I believe that's right. And uh, Scalia said, it was fanciful to think that a sense of gratitude that an individual senator or congressman is going to feel because of a substantial con- contribution to the Republican National Committee or Democratic National uh, Committee is any greater than he would feel for a contribution to a PAC that is spending a lot of money on his election in his district or state. So the idea is that they, they, they create, almost out of whole cloth, because there was no facts that were uh, presented to them in the Citizens United case to that uh, to establish whether or not this money was corrupting uh, by outside expenditures. So they establish in that case that this is not in any way corrupting of our process. And then they turn around and basically cite, hey, look, if it wasn't corrupting in that instance, why should it be corrupting in this instance? Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. I mean, Scalia is right when he says that a huge check given to a super PAC is exactly as corrupting as, as, as a huge check given to a bunch of party organizations. The problem is that once you've figured out that they're the exact same thing, the appropriate thing to say is, oh, Citizens United was wrong then. You know, if, if, if any way that you come up with to get a huge amount of money to help elect a candidate is just as corrupting as any other way, then this silly distinction that claim that super PACs are somehow special and that they somehow don't corrupt candidates is wrong. And if the court was going to do the right thing here, they'd say, we screwed up in Citizens United, Citizens United is overruled, and they'd get all this money out of our elections. And so, so what are the? And we should also say that the lower court that first decided on this, that threw this out, they did not do any fact finding either. In this instance, they simply ruled that this would be corrupting. And we should say that the judge in that case was Janice Rogers Brown. Uh, right. Just tell us about her because she is one of the most extreme right wing judges uh, in this entire country. I think. I mean, I, I don't think that's. I don't think that's hyperbole to say that. I mean, she thinks that we're living in a socialist state right now. That's right. I mean, Janice Rogers Brown is arguably the most conservative, at least the most conservative federal judge in the country. Um, You know, she has called the New Deal a socialist revolution or the Supreme Court cases that allowed the New Deal a socialist revolution. She's compared liberalism to slavery. Um, she wrote a, an opinion once that if you take its rationale seriously, it means that all Wall Street regulations, all business regulations, and all labor regulations have to be viewed with extreme skepticism by judges, and most of them are likely to get struck down immediately. That's who this woman is. And even she said that what the Republican Party is asking for in this one lawsuit is too much. We should leave these limits on spending in place. This is, you know, like I said, arguably the most conservative judge in the country. And now the Supreme Court is looking like they're going to tack to her right. It, I mean, I, I have never heard of a situation where there's a judge looking at Janice Rogers Brown and saying, oh, I, I think she's too moderate. I think we need to do something even more radical than what the woman who can't tell the difference between liberalism and slavery thinks. Well, what's fascinating to me in both, I mean, and, and, and this was, you know, people spoke about this quite a bit in Citizens United, that um, uh, and particularly uh, people focused <clears throat> on Anthony Kennedy's sort of um, complete lack of understanding and and we should say there was no facts brought in front of right. these judges and i think we all have a an assumption that um uh, the if you're a supreme court justice you must know everything about everything as opposed to the reality which is um there's no reason to believe they have any more um, uh, understanding of how things work in the real world uh, than anyone else. And in some instances, I mean, just based upon that interview with uh, with Anthony, with uh, Ant and Scalia the other day, uh, uh, you know, a guy who says, like, I only get my news from The Washington Times and um, and uh, Hugh Hewitt or whatever it is, uh, um, uh, uh, Bennett. Um, you know, uh, uh, from talk show, uh, from uh, talk radio, these guys, uh, Anthony Kennedy said at one point, you know, there's just no there's no reason to believe that if somebody uh, steps into an election or threatens to step into an election with millions of dollars, 
uh, that this is going to influence a candidate or a, a legislator at all. I mean, it's just absurd. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that that the most one of the most remarkable parts about the oral argument on Tuesday was Justice Alito, and Justice Alito is a really smart man. Alito is probably the smartest conservative justice on the court right now, but he's also a really strategic thinker. He's always thinking about what he needs to do to get a more conservative kind of decision in, in, in place. And Alito was acting baffled by the idea that if there was a legal way that someone could set up a money laundering scheme, the hypothetical that people kept talking about was a $3.6 million money laundering scheme that would allow that money to pass through to, to influence candidates. And Alito was baffled by the idea that someone might like, someone might choose to do that, you know, in the same way that he must have seemed baffled by the idea that before Citizens United, we'd have Sheldon Adelson spending $150 million to elect the candidates that he wants to elect. He, he, and I have to think, because Alito is such a smart guy, that he's just being willfully ignorant here. I can't believe he's dumb enough to not understand that if you give people a way to do what they want to do, they will do it. And the entire history of our campaign finance shows that that's the case. I just have to think he was playing ignorant because he thought that that was some strategically the right thing to do. I mean, explain to us about this money laundering, okay? So basically, mm. uh, I mean, walk us through that uh, that hypothetical, which seems to me to be quite obvious, but, but, but walk us through it. Sure thing. So, I mean, there's several different schemes that you could set up. One of them is, you know, there's all these alphabet soup organizations. There's the RNC, the Republican National Committee. There's the RS. Um, CC, there's the RLCC, and there's all Yeah, these, we're talking yeah. about basically the Republican uh, um, uh, Congressional uh, Campaign Committee, the Democratic uh, Congressional right. Campaign Committee, the Senate Campaign Committees of both parties, the national parties, uh, on and on. Right. So there's all these alphabet soup groups, and there's no real limit on the number that either party can create. So if the Democrats wanted to create a million alphabet soup groups, or if the Republicans wanted to create a million alphabet soup groups, they could. And if you eliminate the, the limit on the total amount of money you're able to give to all of these alphabet soup groups, then what's going to happen is someone's going to write the maximum amount that's allowed to every single one of them. If there's a million of them, I think it's a $5,000 limit on the amount that you can give. So it's 5,000 times a million they're allowed to give. And then the rules governing the transfer of money between these organizations are not very strong. Um, the rules governing coordination amongst these groups are not very strong. So once you have distributed this money freely to potentially a million different groups, there are many ways that those groups can work together to essentially pull that money to a common end, whether that's to elect a single person, whether that's to elect, you know, to funnel that money to the five most contested Senate races, whatever they want to do, it's very easy for them to work together to do it. And so that's how the money laundering schemes work, is that you set up a scheme where it looks like you're writing a bunch of different checks to a bunch of different groups, but in reality, the way that that money is going to be used is it's going to be used all for the same purpose. And it's you know easy to imagine a donor having that purpose in mind when they write the check. So, all right, so people have to sort of see the sleight of hand that's taking place here. We're going to say that um, specific limits on what you can give to these groups stay intact. But we're going to say that the uh, we're going to promulgate the number of these groups so that uh, without any type of of cap on how much you can give in total, you could just keep making all these groups. And and the idea that these groups wouldn't coordinate is absolutely silly. I mean, if I'm uh, Sheldon Adelson, if I'm uh, the Koch brothers, if I'm, um, you know, I guess George Soros and I say, look. I'm going to give you guys 5000 I think you uh, 
you know what this is this is going to go towards. Uh, and then these groups get together and go, if we want to keep uh, Mr. Soros happy, who's just given us a billion dollars, uh, we will uh, we will focus it towards uh, this candidate or uh, these specific races. And, you know, money's fungible. Uh, it's, it's money we don't have to spend on those races. We'll get the money for the other uh, for, for the other races. I mean, that's basically the the plan, right? That's right. Yeah. The idea is that, you know, you it allows a smart party and a smart donor to work out a scheme that ends up with enormous amounts of money going to, you know, going to whatever purpose they want. And of course, you know, because the way that this last oral argument played out is they said, well, this distinction between this case and Citizens United doesn't make any sense. So let's just tear down the wall. Um, let's just tear down one wall and make our campaign finance laws even weaker. The minute these money laundering schemes pop up, I tell you what the next lawsuit is going to be. The next lawsuit is going to be, well, if we're already allowing a money laundering scheme that allows a donor to give a $3 million check to someone through some elaborately complex Rube Goldberg machine, why do we do it that way? Why don't we just let him write the check directly? It doesn't make sense to force people to jump through all these stupid hoops. And that's a pretty good argument. If you allow the elaborate money laundering scheme, why not just make it easy? I, you know, I can't think of a, a good reason um, to, to require these elaborate schemes. And so the Supreme Court will then strike down the limit on the amount you can give directly to candidates, and we won't have any meaningful campaign finance law at that point. The, you know, the idea is you start with a ridiculous premise the premise that money given to super PACs and the like doesn't corrupt anyone. And then that premise takes you to the point where these caps that are at stake in this McCutcheon case don't make any sense. And that takes you to the point where the next law doesn't make any sense. And unless you look back and realize that the problem is that Citizens United was wrong, then you can go all the way down this rabbit hole. And, 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 and the, uh, you know, there was an interesting piece by, um, uh, by Lawrence Lassig today saying that, you know, the, the, the uh, Solicitor General for the Obama administration sort of missed an argument that, that, that could have been useful. And that being that the, 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 the narrowness in which the court is looking at the idea of corruption, that it is just about quid pro quo for the corruption of individuals, misses the point of of what the framers of the Constitution meant when they said corruption. He said that uh, Lessig wrote that 57 percent of the times when the framers used the word corruption, they were speaking of institutions. And the one clear and repeated example was an institution that had developed an improper dependence on in the instance of uh, the parliament in, in Great Britain on the king, as opposed to, uh, or, uh, or it could be applied to an improper dependence on an elite group of wealthy people. And yeah. it is quite clear that if you, um, even if you don't even have to argue that all this money is going to end up earmarked in one or two or three or four. I mean, if you have enough money, you, you could fund 100 races uh, well beyond the limits of, of, of what the, the supposed caps impose. But that it, it corrupts the system as a whole because, again, if there are no limits, even in the, in, in the aggregate, you're still going to end up relying on, I don't know, a hundred, on five hundred, on a thousand, on two thousand, on an infinitesimally small number of people who have the capacity to give way beyond what the vast majority of Americans, even in the aggregate, could give. Right. Yeah, no, the, the, you want to talk about dependence um, in the way that Lessig um, was describing it there. The average member of Congress spends a third of their time dialing for dollars and doing other stuff to raise money. You know, the, the, you know as much as four, five, six hours a day, every day, every single member of Congress is trying to get some more bucks out of people. And even if they are raising that money from angels, 
you know, even if they are ma- raising that money from people who want nothing in return, who ask nothing in return, and want nothing but to make sure that the government cures poverty and uh, and eliminates cancer, if that's if that's how they're getting all that money, if you're spending six hours a day raising money, you know what you aren't doing? You aren't learning about the bills you're voting on. You aren't speaking to the rest of your constituents to find out what their what their concerns are. You aren't thinking about what your policy objectives should be. You aren't learning about economics. You aren't learning about health policy. You aren't learning about national security so you can cast intelligent votes in the future. What you are doing is you are turning yourself into an ignorant fundraising machine, not because you're stupid – but because it's the only thing you have time to do. And I don't want that person making laws for me. I want someone who is actually taking the time to sit down and be thoughtful about what they're voting on and who has the time to sit down and be thoughtful about what what, what they're voting on. And if they're spending six hours a day raising money, they're not going to be able to do it. Uh, it, it, you know, we had, uh, I think it was uh, last week on this program, maybe it was earlier this week, I can't even remember, Martin Gillen's on, who's done sort of the um, uh, seminal research on uh, the the influence that money has had on our policy over the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, boils down to, in every policy conflict, regardless of who's in power, uh, regardless of which party is in power, the policy preferences, if there is a conflict, always, always fall to the side of the wealthy as opposed to the vast majority of Americans. Uh, this is not going to uh, help the situation in any way, of course. And it's odd just that this type of data is not introduced in a case like this. I mean, if you're measuring the corrupting influence and never mind the idea of you know corruption as narrowly defined as bribery. But if you're measuring the corrupting influence, it seems completely uh, and utterly um, uh, you know sort of malpractice. Obviously, facts are not um, uh, you know uh, you, you don't argue facts at the Supreme Court level. But if you're going to make a determination of this sort as to whether or not uh, this is corrupting, you need those facts at least in the record. They're not even in the record. Uh, right. Where do you think this case? I mean, what, 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 who will be the um, assuming that we have another five four type of, um, uh, of, uh, of ruling, and maybe that's not the case. But give me your sense. Read the tea leaves if you can. Sure. So the the justice to watch is Chief Justice Roberts. Um, at the oral argument, Roberts was more hesitant than the other conservatives to go all the way. But the fact that he's not willing to go all the way may not get us that much. So Robert seemed to agree that if someone wants to give $3 million and set up an elaborate money laundering scheme to do that, that shouldn't be allowed. But he also seemed to think that the current limits which you know for candidates is about fifty thousand dollars. So that was too low, and I don't know if he thinks that maybe people should be able to give seventy thousand or eighty thousand. I don't know where he where he thinks the line is. So, but the problem is that if Roberts strikes down these limits and says these don't work, Congress go back and come up with another number than we like better. The same thing is going to happen there that we're seeing happening after the Voting Rights Act case that he just decided, where Robert said, yeah, the way that you've done the Voting Rights Act Mm -hmm. isn't right. Congress, if you want to fix it, go ahead. Well, Congress can't tie its shoes right now. We're actually having a debate right now over whether or not Congress is going to disarm a time bomb that will blow up our entire nation's economy. Like, that's how dysfunctional Congress is. If Robert strikes down these limits, even if it would be really easy to write a law that would put most of the limits back, that law's never passing, you know, at least not with these members. So, in other words, it's, uh, I don't have a problem with the concept, I just don't like the formula. If you can come up with a better formula, then we will reinstitute, uh, reinstitute these, um, these limits. Uh, but until that day, we, you know, it's just uh, everybody... Have a free ride. 
Yeah, and it points to a broader problem we have with our Supreme Court right now. You know, last term, the Supreme Court dismantled most of, the law, of our law protecting people from sexual harassment. It dismantled much of our law protecting um, people fr from other forms of discrimination. And Congress could at any minute go back and say, you know what? I think sexual harassment's a problem, and we're going to fix what the Supreme Court just broke, but they aren't going to do it right. because, again, you know, Congress can't figure out whether or not it wants to open the government. How are we going to get them to agree to do anything else? Uh, Ian Mealheiser uh, from the uh, Center for American Progress Action Fund, I appreciate your time today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Sam.